Muscatine, Iowa seems far away from famous Civil War battlefields that are presented in history books. For Americans who were alive in the 1860s, the Civil War touched their lives whether they lived in the North, the South, the Midwest, and other areas of the country. Young men, fathers, husbands, and sons went off to battle, while women, children, and men beyond their prime were left to farm, run businesses, manage the daily needs of their families, assist their neighbors, and support the troops by sending supplies. Iowa sent 76,242 men to serve out of its total population of approximately 675,000. Over 13,000 Iowans died of wounds or disease and 8,500 were injured. Daniel Parvin of Muscatine was one Iowan who served. His words illustrate the types of experiences and concerns of Union soldiers. While he is only one man, his letters home allow us to follow the enlistment process, the time training and becoming accustomed to daily life as a soldier, the travel by steamboat and by foot, the close calls on the battlefield, and the experience of significant bodily injury. Daniel Parvin survived the war and rejoined his family in Muscatine, Iowa. Most of his letters were written to his wife, Sarah, and were intended to be shared with his extended family. Daniel Parvin was born August 12, 1826 in Ohio. He was one of eight children. His family moved to the area that became Muscatine in 1839. Daniel was a cabinet maker who lived in this area for most of his adult life aside from living briefly in California. In April 1860, just over a year before he enlisted in the Civil War, Daniel married Sarah. They had three children, all boys, the oldest born before the war, one born during the war, and the third after the war. In September 1861, Daniel Parvin enlisted as a private in the Union Army at the age of 35, he was much older than his fellow recruits. Daniel served in the 11th Iowa Regiment, Company H, for his entire Civil War service. There were 10 companies in the 11th Iowa Regiment, amounting to 922 soldiers at the time. Daniel was first sent to Camp McClellan in Davenport, where he met his regiment and was issued clothing and supplies. He then boarded a steamship to travel down the Mississippi River to a training facility outside St. Louis. For about three weeks, he drilled with his regiment. Then he was sent by train to Jefferson City, Missouri, and later California, Missouri. Daniel and his regiment boarded another steamboat to travel to Tennessee, where they engaged in the Battle of Shiloh. He was in the thick of the action and served under Ulysses S. Grant. A few of his letters detail his experiences on the Battle at Shiloh, as well as action at the Siege of Vicksburg and skirmishes in Mississippi and Tennessee. Daniel Parvin re-enlisted as a veteran on January 1, 1864 and continued to move with the 11th Iowa Regiment. He suffered gruesome war wounds during the Atlantic Campaign in August 1864 while serving under William Sherman. As we follow Daniel Parvin on his journey as a Civil War soldier, keep in mind that the actors are reading his actual words, taken from his 117 letters home during the Civil War. These letters are preserved in the collection of the Muscatine Art Center. This video project is funded in part by the State Historical Society of Iowa's Historic Resource Development Program. We are tolerably well clothed, but our clothes are not as good as I expected they would be. And yesterday we got one blanket to every two men, and they are poor things, but the boys grumble enough about them without my saying anything about them. But there is one thing sure, and that is the government was imposed upon when they bought our clothing as there is none of it first rate. 
Our grub has been rather short for four or five days, and I feel rather wolfy this morning. Well, I have had my breakfast, and such it was. But if I had something of your cooking, I could eat a hearty meal yet. We had for breakfast a half a pint of beans and a slice of bread about as big as my hand. And that was all, except the dirt that was on my bread and mixed through my beans. And I tell you what, there was plenty of that. Sarah, you say that you would like to have my likeness taken with my uniform on. I am sorry that I cannot get it for you. When a man is a soldier, he cannot do as he pleases. And my clothes are all soiled, my hat is all bruised, and would not be fit to have a likeness taken in if I had a chance. And I have no chance. I have been busy all this morning scouring up my old musket, and that is a job that I do not fancy. But I have it to do or else get punished. A man gets punished sometimes if he should happen to wear his hat instead of his cap when there was no orders given. If being in the army will not cure a man's patriotism, if there's any independence in him, I do not know what would. A man is nothing more than a piece of machinery to be used oftentimes by men for his inferiors. This morning, we received our two months' pay, and I intend to send $25 home. Our pay amounted to $26 to the man, and I thought that I would keep the dollar as I might need a little change. And we all have to pay the head cook 20 cents per month for cooking and overseeing the kitchen department. I have paid him for two months out of the dollar, and I have had to pay 10 cents to have my hair cut. I am tolerable saving, but yet it takes considerable to keep even me. Dear wife and relatives, I take this opportunity to address myself to you. We are here yet, and I do not see any more prospect of our moving than there was when I wrote last. Since I wrote, I have received five letters from home. It makes me feel proud to think that I am thought of at home. Sarah, you want me to give my opinions about the length of this war. Now, I don't want you to consider my opinion in this of much account, but I fear that this war will last for the next 10 years yet. I could give you my reasons for believing as I do, for you know that I always have a reason for my belief. But I am in hopes that I am mistaken in this. I hope that we will discharge in the spring. <clears throat> I did not know how good the boys were until I got sick. And then I found that they were nearly doing to do all they can for me. A great number of them that had better beds than I had offered to give them up to me. And I concluded last night to go upstairs and get out of the noise a little. And one of the boys is a making chicken broth today, and he said that I was considered in. <laughs> I cannot help but feel thankful to them for their kindness to me. And if I should get down sick, I think that I should be very well taken care of as well as could be expected under the circumstances. You will see that I do not write very well today, but it is very hard work for me to write at all. The way we live is enough to make anybody sick. We have nothing but raw bacon, hard crackers, and coffee. And the coffee I do without so that it makes my living pretty slim. I am getting so tired of bacon and crackers that I can hardly bear them. But I am hungry all the time, and I have to eat enough of them to keep my soul and body together. It would be so nice to sit down at the table with you and have all the vegetables that I could eat, save fried potatoes and onions. Don't you think that I would eat a good deal? 
If you don't, I do. Dear wife, I sit down only for a moment to do as you have requested me to do, and that is to write to you if we get into a battle. We have been into a big fight that lasted two days without intermission. The first day they drove us back about three miles, and then we, being reinforced about four o'clock, we commenced to drive them and drove them about half a mile that night. It got dark, so that firing was stopped pretty much for the night, but early next morning it was commenced again and we kept driving them all day. Yours forever, Daniel J. Parvin. Dear wife and relatives, I take this opportunity to write to you. I wrote you a short letter after we had the fight to let you know that I was not hurt. And today I shall try and tell you some of the things that happened in our company. I shall not attempt to describe the battle in general for that, you can read from the papers in better shape and more correct than I could give them to you. Our company was formed and marched in line with the rest of the regiments, and we had not been formed but a few moments when we were ordered to advance towards the enemy. We had not gone far before we began to hear the balls whistle pretty thick around us, and then we was put on double quick for about a quarter of a mile, and then we were ordered to halt and form a line of battle. And as soon as we were in line, we were ordered to lay down, and about that time, the enemy opened fire on us. When we laid down, William Gordon was at my left hand and William Mickasell at my right, and we had not fired but once or twice before Gordon was shot through the thigh. And I looked around, and I saw that some of the boys that would sooner help off with the wounded than fight. So I told Gordon to crawl back, and some of the boys would help him off. And then he crawled back and was helped down to the boat. And we had not fired. But a round or two after that, when a ball hit William Nickasell, he said, he said, I am shot. Carry me back. I put my hand on him and said, Bill, where are you hit? He made me no answer. But I turned on his back, and I seen at a glance that it made but little difference to him whether he was carried back or not. So I kept on with my shooting, and directly after that, two men was shot almost right behind me. One killed, the other wounded. And about that time, it was seen that the enemy were flanking us, so we were ordered to fall back. And we fell back about 50 yards and made another stand. Some of the boys forgot to stop. I shall not mention any names now. But it was soon found that the enemy were too strong for us. So we were ordered to fall back and we would fall back a piece and make a stand, and so the thing kept going. We had no general at all. General Grant, it is said, was at Savannah asleep. One thing is certain, he was not with his command. I have no confidence in the man. If General Buell had been in command on Sunday, they would not have drove us back as they did. Buell got here on Sunday evening, and he, he sent out word along the lines that if we would keep them in check, just two hours longer, he would take them off our hands and let us rest. And from that time, we commenced to drive them back. When we drove them back about half a mile, night came on, and fighting was nearly stopped. They were in possession of our camp one night, and they took everything that I had, except my Bible. They did not leave me even a change of shirts. They stole all that they could lay hands on, and they robbed the pockets of our dead. In our company, we had three killed and 17 wounded. You will see who they are in the paper before you get this. In walking over the field the day after, the scenes was awful. You could see our men and theirs laying in mangling masses together and dead bodies scattered all over the ground, some with their heads shot entirely off others with their bodies almost cut in two with cannonballs, but the greater part were killed by small balls. And walking over the field, I saw the dead body of Jim Howell. That was the only one out of our company that I knew. Besides having a man taken from both sides of me and two from behind me, one of the boys from behind me shot so close to my head 
that the powder burned my face near, and I turned around and I gave them a talking to about that. <sighs> you want to know if I killed any rebels? I do not know. I shot 25 or 30 times, but whether I hit anybody or not, I cannot say. You want to know if they did not look pretty when they were fallen? I say no, for I do not glory in the death of any man, not even my enemies. But I would rather they would do right and live. But they are very strong yet, and they fight with a courage worthy a better cause. I do not blame the rebel soldiers so very much, for they say that they are fighting for their bread and meat. The rich will go to the poor and tell them that they have got to fight or starve. Others are drove into it by threatening to kill them if they do not enlist in the Southern cause. And the prisoner told us that the officers on the battlefield stood behind the men with drawn sword and pistol and swore that they would shoot the first man that offered to run. So, under the circumstances, it is not much wonder that the men fought brave. They thought that it was better to be shot by us than to be shot by their own officers. There was one poor wounded rebel that had received his death wound. And as the American flag was carried past, he looked up at it and said that he thanked God that he was to go and to die beneath the American flag. And I have an idea that there are plenty of rebels that would gladly leave their flag and fight under the stars and stripes. But they were told that we kill all that we get our hands on and their ignorance make them believe anything that their leaders tell them, for they cannot read for themselves. And if they could read, they do not the opportunity, for slavery requires ignorance. I am well now and getting fat. I weigh 149 pounds, and that is as much as I ever weigh in the summertime. And I think that I shall be able to stand this climate first rate. There is but little sickness now in the 11th Regiment, and only one in our company, and that is Taylor. And I think that he will die if he cannot get to come home pretty soon. But it seems almost impossible for a private to get a furlough. There is a great injustice done to soldiers in this respect, as well as a great many other respects. Their lives are not counted of much value, and their feelings are not counted at all by a great many of the officers. Today is the Sabbath, but it is not a day of rest to me, for today I have got to wash my clothes and go to the regiment, and there is various other little jobs that I have got to do. And the boss is after me now to go to polishing. And as I am a soldier, I shall have to obey orders. And by the time that is done, it will be time that I was at work at my other jobs. You sent me a lock of Fred's hair and want to know my opinion about the color. Well, my opinion is that it might be very much the color of my whiskers, but maybe not. It is hard to tell anything about it until he gets older. Since I last wrote, this part of the army has done but very little but lay around camp and eat our grub. We have not even a good chance to keep ourselves clean, for we have to haul our water about five miles, and we are allowed only so much each day, and that is only enough to cook and drink. <sighs> and they do not allow us to go outside our lines unless we have a pass and it is a good deal of trouble to get one of them. So that it is very inconvenient for us to go out to wash our clothes or anything else. But as we are soldiers, we have got to stand it. And we try to be as cheerful as we can, but I frequently see some pretty long faces. Sarah, I often look at your likeness, and it gives me pleasure to look on the features of the one that I love most. As 
As I expected yesterday, I was on guard and a disagreeable time we had of it. For it rained nearly all night and it was darker than a stack of black cats. And I got but very little sleep. And in consequence of the weather and the loss of sleep, I do not feel in very good spirits. Since I last wrote, I was quite sick for two days with the sick headache, but I am middling well now. Sarah, you ask me if I think the war will last three years. That I don't know. But if it does, I want you to be ready to leave the country with me as soon as my time is up. For I think that that will be the best thing that I can do. And I should like to know whether you are willing to go with me or not. I think that someplace in Brazil will suit me. Sarah, you seem to want to see me very bad. But I do not think that you want to see me any worse than I want to see you. I want to see you so bad that I am almost homesick and have got the blues. But all this does no good, and I shall have to content myself the best I can, for it does no good to complain. I have not re-enlisted yet, and I think that I shall study on it a while yet before I do enlist. But if I was a young man, or what I mean is if I had not a good wife, I should not study long about it. But as it is, I do not think that I shall enlist again. But I make no rash promises, for I love my country. And if she needs me, I had ought to serve her. But no more of this for the present. Sarah, when I am sick, that is the time that I miss those kind attentions that you used to pay to me. You are on my mind nearly all the time, and especially when I am not well. Tomorrow is Christmas, and the thought of home and the pleasant times there will make it a gloomy day for me. But I do not envy anybody in their enjoyment. I only wish that I was in the situation to enjoy myself along with the rest. Tomorrow will be the third Christmas that I had spent in the service of my country, and oh, what a long time it has been to me. I believe that I am doing right in trying to put down this dreadful rebellion. If it was not for this belief, I can assure you that I would not be soldiering now, for it is anything but a pleasant business to me. And I shall be dreadful glad when this dreadful war is at an end. And when that will be, only he that knows all things can tell. But I sincerely hope that the time is close at hand, when our beloved country will be again united and peace and plenty will again take the place of war and its natural consequences, which are misery in all its various forms. I do not think that I could be happy if I was to desert my country whilst she needs my services. I thought so when I re-enlisted, and Sarah, I hope that you will not blame me too hard for doing what I considered my duty. Now, Sarah, I may be crazy, and I may have done wrong to love my country so well as to be willing to deny myself all the pleasures of the society of my family and friends. And I might have deceived you by holding out the idea to you that I would not re-enlist. But I myself was deceived, for I did not think two days before I re-enlisted that it would have been possible for me to have gone in. And Sarah... If I have done wrong, I pray that you will forgive me, for I have done as I thought was right. Sarah, I do not blame your being worried about my going in as a veteran. It is enough to vex any woman that thinking anything of their men. And it makes me love you all the better. And if I have done wrong, I hope that you will forgive me. Sarah, 
I love no other woman as I love you. And I hope and pray that we may live long and happy together. Since I last wrote, we have marched over 100 miles over a rough, rocky country. And my feet got very sore so that for the last two days I have walked with a good deal of pain. But I have managed to keep up this far. We got to this place around 10 o'clock today, and I understand that we strike out for some place further south tomorrow morning. I am in hopes that my feet will be better by that time. But as the time is so short, I cannot expect them to get entirely well, but I guess that I can stand it. Dear wife and relatives, I again sat down whilst the noise of musketry and the boom of cannon is constantly sounding in my ear and attempt to write you a few lines. Since I last wrote, we have seen a good deal of war and its effects. We have moved about 15 miles to the left of where we were when I last wrote. We marched all of one night and nearly all the next day in order to get in our position. And then our brigade had to drive the rebels off. And we have drove them about five miles since we took up our position on the right. We have done most of our marching in the line of battle through the brush. And in some places it was so dreadful thick so that it was almost impossible to get through. Dear wife and relatives, as this is my birthday, I thought that I would spend a part of it in writing to you. It has not been quite a week since I wrote to you, but most likely our company will be on picket tomorrow so that I should not have a chance to write for two days. For the pickets have all that they can attend to, to watch the enemy, for our lines are getting pretty close together and they keep up nearly a constant firing on both sides. And there is a good many killed and wounded every day by this way. And now it's while I'm writing, the balls are almost constantly whistling past me and occasionally one will strike a soldier that happens to be in his course. But such are the effects of war and we get used to such things and pay but little attention to them. The rebels shell us nearly all the time here and I tell you that the sound of their shell as they pass through the air is not very pleasant to the ear for we cannot tell where they are going to strike and perchance they strike the man next to you and we do not know but what our turn may be next. But that is the chance we all run for the sake of our country. The rebels attacked our pickets three times last night and we were called up in line of battle each time. But at such a time, it does not take us long to get into line and ready for a fight. But I would rather fight them in the daytime if it should suit them, for I can see how to shoot better by daylight. Dear wife, I again undertake to let you know that I am yet counted among the living. And not only that, but I am considered doing well. But Sarah, I shall be a dreadful homely man when I get well, for they took so much out of my jawbone that it will let my cheeks and lips settle in and my teeth are all about gone. And there's various other ailments too numerous to mention now. It will be some time before I shall be able to travel and I do not know whether they intend to send me north or not but I hope that they will. Time will tell these things. I will try to give you a history of myself as I remember things from the time that I was shot until now. When the ball struck me, I was squatting down close to the breastworks. When the ball first struck me, I thought that my head was gone. And then the boys commenced to collect around me. And then I got over on my knees and put my hand up to my face. And I could hear the boys talking and I could think. And I know by that, that I was not shot through the brain and they asked me if I could walk. I told them yes. And they took a hold of me and led me back about 200 yards and there we met the boys coming with the stretcher and I got into that and they carried me to the division hospital and there was three or 
four doctors there, but most of them shook their heads when they saw me and did not see inclined to do anything for me. But finally, as they had nothing else to do, they thought that they would see if there could be anything done for me. So they got me on their chopping block and gave me chloroform. But it had little effect on me, for I knew all that was going on all the time. And they took out several loose pieces of bone, and one good big piece of my jawbone, it having four teeth on it. After that, they let me go back to my bunk. I believe that they thought that I would bleed to death, and I guess that I did come pretty near it. Well, I laid there and bled all night. And the next day, they sent me here. And they fed me with a stomach tube for two or three days, but I found out that I was a going to starve if I did not find out some other way besides that. So I concluded that I would try some other plan. And I found that by holding my nose that I could drink a little, and that is the way that I have to do yet. And I cannot eat anything, only what I can drink, but I can drink almost anything now. But the most of my living is gruel. But I can drink that quite thick now. My appetite is good. They have taken my name for a furlough, but how soon it will come I cannot tell, but I hope as soon as I am able to travel. As I have filled my sheet full, I close, ever remaining yours. I have suffered a good deal for my country, and if necessary I am willing and ready to die for my country if necessary. But, I am in hopes that sacrifice will not be required. But there are many that are better than I am, that will yet suffer death before this terrible rebellion is put down. In February 1865, Daniel Parvin was discharged as a corporal and returned to Muscatine and his wife Sarah. Sadly, Sarah died in 1866 at the age of 25. Daniel married again in 1868, but the new couple had no children. The injuries he sustained in September of 1864 are believed to be connected to his development of cancer of the mouth. Daniel Parvin died of cancer at the age of 53 on February 24, 1880 and is buried in Greenwood Cemetery in Muscatine.